Remo Drive. Remo Drive was a band started in the end of 2013 in Bloomington, Minnesota, with lead singer and lead guitarist being Eric Paulson, and on the instrument that nobody really fucking cares about, Steven Paulson on bass. Okay, come on guys, that was a fucking joke. Don't dislike the video for it. So today we're gonna see how this low-key emo pop punk Minnesota band started, and how one album review would gain them a lot of traction. This this is Remo Drive, a history. Steven and Eric Paulson grew up in Bloomington, Minnesota. Steven was born on February 29th of 1996, which is actually a leap year, and Eric was born on September 7th of 1997. They were best friends growing up, and when they both started kindergarten, they started taking piano lessons together. Eric was really inspired to play guitar, Right after he played the video game Guitar Hero, he was at an after school program and he played the song Smoke on the Water. The following year, he also knew this kid that went to his school. The kid would play guitar at their school talent shows, he used to wear all American reject shirts and had a huge CD collection, and Eric thought he was super cool and wanted to be like him. Eric was pretty much an outcast in middle school. He said that he was kind of fat and people would bully him for it. So he thought if he could learn how to play guitar, then maybe people would think he was cool. When he first started learning guitar, he said that he went through a quote unquote shredding stage. He loved the band Megadeth and he said he had a different shirt of theirs for each day of the week. Steven saw that Eric was learning how to play the guitar and about a year later, he thought he could do the same thing. So he took a lesson and after the first lesson, he realized this was not for him and eventually he would pick up the bass. Steven started playing around 2008 and he took private lessons via a music school near them called School of Rock. And don't get confused because I'm not talking about the movie. He would take lessons through middle school and some of high school. He said his bass teacher was really into R&B and funk. Steven later said that he would learn how to play guitar, drums, and obviously piano. He said he was really inspired by bands like Metallica, Foo Fighters, and Chai Chang from Deftones. He would go see bands like this at a venue called First Street in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And there was actually a smaller venue connected to First Street called 7th Avenue which small bands could play with the capacity being about 250 and I'm pretty sure First Street was about oh, a little over a thousand. Over time, Steven would master the bass and he would even play in his school's jazz band. As they slowly progressed with their instruments, Eric and Steven would start to jam with one another. They would play cover songs and even played in the school talent shows and they went under the name Firestorm with fire being spelled F-Y-R-E. And they once tried to play a cover song of Beat It by Michael Jackson and Eric tried to play the solo in the song but he said it wasn't good at all. Eric and Steven would also play in another band with other members and the band was called Kinda Incredible. They even wrote original songs like Two-Legged Horse, Done, Angst, Insomnia, Faint at the Sight of a Gun, and I Am Alone. And I'm pretty sure this was their middle school slash beginning of high school band. Some of the members of this band would actually be touring members with Remo Drive, but that would just be later on in the years. And you can actually find their performances on YouTube. I'll put the link in the description if you guys want to go check it out. When Eric started his freshman year in high school, he took songwriting a lot more serious. And he realized he didn't just want to be a guitarist. Eric and Steven would kind of split up in high school in a sense. They both would be playing in different bands, but eventually they got sick of being in other people's bands and they kinda just wanted to do their own thing. In their sophomore to junior year of high school, they saw a lot of kids wearing title fight shirts around school. And if you didn't know, they are just like a pop punk band. And anyway, Eric and Steven would listen to them and they wanted to make music like that. So that led into them starting their own band and they went by the name Remo Drive, and their first show was on December 6th of 2013. In the beginning, it was just Eric and Steven, and they would get people to fill in as needed, and I'm pretty sure even Steven played drums on occasion. Steven is the one who came up with the name Remo Drive, 
He said one time he was cleaning out his basement and he saw his drum kit and the company of the drum kit was called Remo and he thought Drive just kind of flowed well with it. And the name really doesn't have that much meaning, he said. They also said Remo Drive was a tribute to older kids who smoked weed and listened to Title Fight. Steven had a friend at school who was in a band called Q the Click and I guess they were going through a lineup change and he asked Steven to play bass with them. So Steven started jamming with them and playing bass and during his time with that band, he would become friends with the drummer Sam Amathis, and Sam used to be in a band called Blainted Youth. Anyway, Steven thought he was pretty cool, and after a practice one time, he asked Sam if he wanted to jam with him and Eric, and Eric thought that Sam would never want to jam with them because he thought Sam's band was a lot better than his. But obviously, Sam would jam with them, and he would eventually join the band in 2014. Sam also took lessons at the School of Rock, where Eric and Steven both learned how to play. So Eric and Steven both had a bunch of songs that they were playing and kind of recorded I think on GarageBand and they would actually release an EP in 2014 and it was a bunch of re-recordings of their 2013 songs but now as a three-piece with Sam on drums the title tracks of the songs were Rain Man, Away, and Highland. This sound was completely different from what they sound like now. This EP was just full of anger and angst and Eric just screaming at you through the heavy guitar riffs, but overall it was some pretty good songs. And they later would release another EP called Stay Out Longer. One of the songs on that EP was called My Good Friend is a Pro Skater, and I'm pretty sure this is the first song that they ever recorded with Sam. And this was released in August of 2014, and CDs were released through Rolling Green Records. Anyway, this EP wasn't really different from the last EP that they released. Still very angsty, a little bit toned back, I don't think Eric was screaming as much at us. They definitely had influence from Title Fight as they said, also sorority noise, the story so far, any genre that's really emo or pop punk. Later in 2014, they would release a full LP called Demos, which was pretty much remasters of all their stuff they previously worked on. I read in an interview that they said Andy Matheson helped them record some of the songs and he might have produced it, I'm pretty sure. And the only place you can find these EPs and the LP is on YouTube. Uh, Remo Drive took it down and I'll get into that a little bit later. Sam would later leave the band in 2014 due to creative differences, so they would have Austin Voigt join the band. So they released a couple LPs in 2015. I'm pretty sure the first one that they released was called A Series of Unfortunate Events, and it was a split EP with the band called Withered, and it was released off Rolling Green Records. And then on May 1st of 2015, they released another EP that was similar to A Series of Unfortunate Events called Wait for the Sun. And personally, out of everything they released prior to Greatest Hits, I have to say this EP is probably my favorite. Some of these songs kind of just sound like Smashing Pumpkin songs. I know that's kind of fucking crazy to say. At least the beginning of the songs. The song Forgiveness straight up sounds like Mayonnaise from Smashing Pumpkins. Obviously, just... yes, it sounds different from each other, but I feel like they took some influence from them too. They would also later release two other EPs in 2015, and it was Force songs all together between both EP slash singles, I guess. Off of one of the EPs, the two songs were called Perfume and Breathe In. And off the other EP they released with a band called Unturned, the two songs were called Passing Through and Heartstrings. And supposedly the song Passing Through was about how Eric hates school, and a song called Heartstrings, and Heartstrings would be re-released in 2018. Personally, I think these four songs on the two EPs sound pretty much exactly like each other with the same vibe they're going for and on the last two EPs they released Wait for the Sun and a series of unfortunate events I think those songs sound like each other with the slow guitar in the beginning and then the band coming crashing in between the middle so it was kind of cool they recorded some songs like how they previously worked on in 2014 and then with the other two EPs they had the same vibe but they slowed things down a lot which was really cool and interesting so during all these releases they would do small tours in the Midwest and they would actually have to take time off from school just to go on tour and it took a little convincing but their parents finally let them go. When they first started selling their merch at shows they said their original designs on the shirts used to be written in on Sharpie. So Eric graduated in the summer of 2015 and he would take classes in like a community college music school 
He really liked recording and editing music, and he wanted to be an audio mixer. He would later on mix some music for other artists, I'll get into that near the end. In early of 2016, Austin had to leave the band due to personal hardship. They were actually still in contact with Sam, and Sam would rejoin the band in March of 2016. One of the first songs the trio released since getting back together was a holiday song called Under the Christmas Tree, and that was obviously near the end of 2016. They recorded a music video for it, and this would gain them a little more attention in the online community. So Remo had been working on a bunch of new songs, and they had about 16, but they wanted to release an album with just 10 songs. One of the first singles that they released was a song called You're Killing Me, and it had a music video to go with the single. And the approach to their music recordings was completely different from anything they've ever done before. Obviously, they had some of their old roots, but changed it to have more of a unique sound. And they would eventually take down all their other projects prior to this new album coming up, Greatest Hits. I'll get into that in a little bit. But they took everything down because they said they thought they were just trying to sound like other bands, and they weren't reaching their full potential. They were really happy with the outcome of their first single, You're Killing Me, and they loved the music video that they did for it. It was shot in the back of Steven's SUV in a neighborhood that they grew up in. They said it costed them about $40 to shoot the music video. They would eventually send their music video link to one of the most popular album reviewers of the decade. Yep, Anthony Fantano from The Needle Drop. And as of December of 2019, he has just hit 2 million subscribers. So somehow, he came across the email that they sent him. And supposedly he said he didn't message them back and he just watched the video and he thought it was fucking awesome. And they were actually first featured on his channel on his best slash worst tracks. He said he really enjoyed the music video with Eric screaming and running behind the car and he really liked the instrumental beat at the end. After Fantano reposted and talked about them in his video, they would gain a lot of attention and people would fall in love with You're Killing Me. They would also post the link on a subreddit called listen to this and it got over a thousand votes and i'm pretty sure it's at 3.8 or something thousand votes right now the band said that they were scared about all the hype over one song because they weren't really sure how people would feel about the full lp every song wasn't exactly the same as you're killing me they first started writing the songs for their upcoming album greatest hits in march of 2016 and that was about the time sam rejoined the band they supposedly we recorded the whole record in Eric's parents house some in the living room some in the basement and some in Eric's room and they started to record the record in July of 2016 they emailed a few producers asking them to mix their album and they came upon Jack Shirley Jack responded to their email and he said he would produce it for a reasonable price Remo said that they recorded all the music by themselves and then they sent him the files over email on March 16th of 2017 Greatest Hits was released. It wasn't released off a record label because they worked with the DIY labels prior to this record and they said they didn't really like it and they wanted more freedom. They named the album Greatest Hits to be funny and they weren't taking themselves seriously at all. Steven said he really didn't like the name Greatest Hits, he thought it was kind of stupid and tacky but Eric convinced him otherwise, and they topped off the joke by wearing turtlenecks for the album cover. Eric took a lot of inspiration from the Police album covers. Ah, uh, alrighty, let's get into the album. Eric said the writing for it wasn't that deep at all, and he said one or two of the songs were about relationships and the rest were about weird friendship stuff. But I don't really know about all that, cause let's get into this and I think he's just bullshitting with us and trying to hide that this is all about a girl. So they kick off with art school and before we talk about this, that has a sick ass music video. It was shot at Sam's old high school, and Sam was actually the only one who went to art school. That was just a kind of a fun fact. Eric paints a picture of a past relationship in which his former lover was a high and mighty, pretentious, snotty asshole who missed all his shows. He's talking about art school, describing a hipsterish person with dyed hair, and he talks about my band somewhere in Dinky. And Dinky Town is a neighborhood place in Minneapolis, and obviously he probably had shows there. And he talks about his small empire, which is his small low-key band. Coming up next, we got Hunting for Sport. And obviously Eric is probably talking about him and his former girlfriend. In it, he quotes, 
head for your collection hanging on the wall saying that his significant other isn't looking for a long-term relationship and is only hunting for another trophy obviously another boyfriend and near the end of the song sam shows off how good of a drummer he actually is and his drumming style reminds me of zach hill's drumming style when he was with waves for a little bit but sam really kicks ass and he was the best drummer they ever had also i thought it was a really cool transition to the next song crash test rating and again that was the first song Sam and Eric wrote together. One of the next songs, Strawberita. Strawberita. Not really sure if I said that right. Anyway, that was one of the band's favorite songs to record. They added a bunch of auxiliary and they used a minion toy, obviously from the movie Despicable Me, to get some sound effects from it. Eric said in an interview, the song wasn't about another person. It's a chronicle of different feelings he felt in his first experience with an excessive amount of alcohol. The next song, Summertime, Eric is explaining that his ex-girlfriend was an emotionally abusive asshole, kinda having a similar meaning to the song, Hunting for Sport, and it kinda has similar lyrics to the Sublime song, Do In Time. Eric said the next song, Eat Shit, was inspired by him falling off his skateboard and having to get stitches all the time and being embarrassed about it. He said his mom used to be a hospital nurse, and every time he went in to get stitches, all the doctors knew him and again he's saying in the song I'm no stranger to hospital lobbies also the song is dealing with getting older and kind of still acting like a kid because when you get older you shouldn't be going to the hospital all the time just to get stitches because you're falling off your skateboard and he's saying that he's not mature because of it the next song trying to fool you again about an ex-girlfriend he wanted to break up with but at the same time he didn't and he wanted to maybe be friends Yes, that never works. But after they broke up, she completely ghosted him and he slowly loses control of who he used to be. The next song, You're Killing Me, which is the song that kicked off their popularity. Eric said on Twitter, this was about his quote unquote dumbass professor. But again, I don't know. I feel like he might be lying to us because all these lyrics do sound like a relationship. And honestly, he might've been really hurt by it, but he's trying to lie and hide his feelings. But as the clueless listener, we really don't know what they were going through and we could just be reading into it too much. So again, I want to state that these are just my opinions of what I think the songs are about. I'm my own doctor. Anyway, Eric kind of sounds like a hypochondriac saying he is self-diagnosed. Could be a mental one too. Metaphors with the Tylenol and Aspirin and Robex. Then we're going to hit up the last song, Name Brand. And the band said this is their favorite one to play. You know, I'm going to take a shot in the dark of what I think this song is about. This song is about growing up and still acting like a child. Talks about name brands. And in the United States, that kind of defines a perfect life with the meaning of all these things should make you happy, being popular and rich should make you happy. In reality, it really doesn't. So this one wraps up the album, and that was literally their greatest hit. There isn't one song that really overpowers another, and I thought the quality of the recording was still cool. Even they recorded it themselves. It just straight up sounds like they put a few mics in front of their drum set and just fucking went at it, which is great because I honestly love the raw feel of an album. And you know, it kind of gives you hope for smaller bands because you know, if they can do it, why can't you do it? And Fantano would obviously review this record and he would call it the emo record of the year. So after the record, they kind of blew up in a sense and got super fucking popular, especially after Fantana reviewed the full album. So they would tour the album the rest of the year, and near the end of the year, all I gotta say is things aren't always sunny in paradise, because their best drummer that they ever had was kicked out in December of 2017. Congratulations, Remo Drive, for ruining your career. And Sam seemed really torn apart about it, and he was venting on Instagram a lot, but I think very highly of him, because not once did he slam the band, wished the Paulson brothers the best, and I thought that was very professional of him. So Steven and Eric didn't really post anything until Sam did and they posted about it on Facebook and they didn't slam him either so that's professional of them but behind closed doors who really knows what happened I know this is really irrelevant but I'm just gonna bring it up because who knows it might be true 
There was a kind of a post on Reddit basically saying Steven was an asshole to his ex-girlfriend and Remo Drive cared about their image way too much. So, you know, this could be true or it could be bullshit. So who really knows? But, you know, that might come into effect. They might have broken up because maybe a dispute about signing to a record label. I know that one of their next drummers was another Sam, which is really confusing. His name was Sam Bretch. And they also would switch out Braden Keenan on drums. Braden is actually one of the members that played in Steven and Eric's band back in the day, kinda incredible. They also had Dane Foley join to play guitar in 2019, and Dane was actually one of the guitarists in that band too. They probably were all in contact with each other and they probably were like, we're gonna get the band back together guys. <laughs> also I didn't want to leave out Zach Cummings used to play guitar for them in 2016 to 2019, and they would also have Lee Tran play saxophone, synthesizers, and tambourine, and I'm pretty sure that he was the one who shot the music video for them, You're Killing Me. In February of 2018, Remo Drive signed to Epitaph Records. They would actually release a three song EP the next month. On March 9th of 2018, their EP Pop Music was released. And this was some of the first songs that they actually recorded in a real studio. They took the same idea of greatest hits and they mixed it with pop music, you could say. On this EP, they were really taken back in a sense with Eric not kind of whining his vocals that much. And this EP would be a foreshadowing of what we would see on their next upcoming LP. My favorite song was Blue Ribbon. And honestly, I didn't really like any of the other ones. Song of the Summer sounded like something that would be off a newer Green Day record. Oh yeah, and I can't forget to mention how they fucking ruined the song Heartstrings. I mentioned this earlier, that they released the song Heartstrings off a single slash joined EP in 2015, and if you don't remember, all these projects were taken offline, but they still left the Heartstrings original music video up. Oh my god, like, they tried to give this song a facelift, but in the worst way possible. It already sounded really good, and they could have just reposted that. The chorus sounds a little auto-tuned or just poorly produced, and Eric doesn't sound as, again, upfront and in your face in a sense. He's just kind of drawn back and more conservative and just, just a little bitch. I'm going to have you guys take a listen to it yourself before you guys start ripping me up in the comment section. And I felt this way. I personally think a band has freedom to do whatever they want. To take the old one offline and then put this out is just like, what the fuck, man? Eventually next year on May 31st of 2019, they released their new LP, Natural Everyday Degradation. And boy, did this sound completely different from what we all expected. They added a bunch of different sounds to this album. Again, this one was produced by Joe Reinhardt, and it was recorded in the Headroom in Philadelphia. While writing this album, Eric said he really got into Mac DeMarco, and he bought himself a 4-track and would record a bunch of demos on there. This album doesn't really have any Mac DeMarco vibes to me. You know, I had some hope for this album, with the first two tracks being Two Bucks and The Grind, and on Honestly, yes, those sounded a lot different from Greatest Hits, but they were still good songs, and especially that they were trying to go in a different direction, and the song Two Bucks was inspired by Bruce Springsteen. And then there's the song Shaken. They ripped off the lyrics to the ACDC song, You Shook Me All Night, and they pretty much hacked up a fucking loogie on the back in black golden record. And the next song, Dog, is about having trouble with anxiety during a romantic time. And then the song Separate Beds sounds like something that Justin Bieber or Timberlake or Bruno Mars would record. The way his vocal range is fucking incredible, but what the fuck, man? It just sounds like a boy band pop vocalist from 2000. 
2009 to 2010. I feel like some of these songs could have been really awesome if they just took a different approach to it. The whole album is kind of like a story, and again, it has the same kind of meaning as greatest hits in the sense of just an aging relationship and couples getting bored of each other. Like the song Ezra and Marla might be the main characters of all of this, and this album did not live up to the expectations that the fans wanted. And Fantano didn't even give this album the time of day. He reviewed it for like a second, but he didn't give a full in-depth review because he thought it was shit probably. This album wasn't a terrible record. For people that really like that type of music, they probably enjoyed it. But for me, it was like a 5, 4.5 out of 10. Then near the end of 2019 on October 1st, they released like a NED extended play with a new song called Romeo and Nearly Perfect. And the new song Romeo kind of gives me a little hope for the band. That one was good, but still with the new style, I dig it a lot. Then they remastered Separate Beds, and this makes it sound more pop than ever. Then with the last song, Nearly Perfect, was alright. It kind of gives me a Killers vibe to it. Then in the beginning of December, they would release an Eric Paulson mix on the song Shaken. I saw on the Reddit that a lot of people said they aren't playing their old songs anymore, and even one of the set lists didn't even have You're Killing Me. And if they do play some of the original songs, it sounds like they aren't even trying and aren't putting as much effort into it. Honestly, I don't know if Rima will ever be the same again, because once a band changes style, they seem to never go back to their older style. But you know, I wish the best for Remo, and I really like their band and Greatest Hits. Their new album was kind of weak. Who knows what they'll release next? You know, everyone has a bad album. You know, this is their sophomore slump. So that pretty much wraps our video up. Let's get into some fun facts. They one time went around town and started placing CDs in random places at record shops as a scavenger hunt for the fans. Eric one time said he is vegan, I'm not sure if he is anymore. He also has some side projects like Half Mannequin, Focus Ring, and Skid Marks. Eric worked at a place called Brugger's Bagels in Minnesota. Eric also has produced some songs for some bands. I'm not going to talk about them all, but there will be a link in the description. Alright, and finally, how could I forget Emo Dave? So after hours of searching, I finally found an interview about this. At first, I thought it was just a play on words for real emo drive. Eric said one time he was designing t-shirts and he wrote this little emo goth character and then he wrote the words emo Dave above it and that was their mascot for a little bit. Unfortunately I couldn't find any pictures but if you have a picture or know where to find one put the link in the fucking comments people. Their original drummer Sam Mathis said someone carved emo Dave into his high school bathroom's toilet paper holder. All right, let's do a quick my top favorite songs. So starting off, we got You're Killing Me, Trying to Fool You, I'm My Own Doctor, off of their first LP, Greatest Hits. Then off of their EP, I have Blue Ribbon. Then this song would also be off of that EP, but fuck this remastering version because I like the original version better. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys do too. Anyway, this was off of their split EP and that song is called Heartstrings. 